Today we're continuing our theme of looking at why we're here and we're talking about discipleship today. We're going to focus on for a bit about this idea of focusing on this gathered community of followers of Christ who are called to be here and what our purpose in being here in is beyond worship, beyond ministry, in focusing on becoming disciples of Christ who are, who are called and challenged to look like Jesus. We are called to gather in this place and to engage in this community of faith, not just for the the time of music and not just for the the financial contribution and not just for the, the emotional support that we find when we pray for one another and we encourage one another. We are ultimately called to be here to engage in a relationship where we are being discipled to be followers of Christ who look like Him in our behavior and our words and our actions. When we talk about why are we here, we are here to become disciples We are here to be people who, here to learn and to grow and become people who look like, act like, sound like, a little bit like Jesus. And when people do this, when people start engaging in relationships like this and engaging in some authenticity, they start creating something rather special. They create something that's rather significant in in communities when we start looking at what a healthy church might look like. I don't know about you, but I want to be engaged in things that are healthy and whole and productive. I want to be engaged in things that are making a difference, not just in, in the here and now, but are going to make difference in the long-term part of life. We look at what a healthy church might look like that's made of followers of Christ, growing followers of Christ, and we see things that, and we describe it as a place that is positive. It's not negative. It's not backbiting. We're talking about a place that has some vibrancy, where the culture is is growing, where the culture is intent on making a difference and serving in the name of Christ. We look at a church that builds strong relationships, where people enjoy being together, where there's a sense of fellowship and, and love that is shared. We look at a place that has some transparency and some authenticity, where we can talk about hard issues in our life, where we can be honest with friends when we're struggling with some difficult pieces in our, in our journey. We talk about authenticity and we talk about this picture of what a healthy church looks like. It's made up of people, you and me, who are making a commitment to follow Christ and making a decision to live like Him. Now we sometimes are confronted with some unhealthy churches that we've been a part of and part of, maybe part of our journey. And, and I, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago to Google this, this idea of abandoned churches in Chicago. And this is, happens to be a church in Philadelphia. And you look at the size of that sanctuary. Look at that majestic organ that's falling apart. Look at all the garbage that's in there. What happened to that church? What happened to the people who gave so much money, so much time, so much of their talent to that place that it it just faded away and is literally crumbling from within? What causes a church? What causes a church that's willing to invest that kind of money and that kind of talent to do this? How does that happen? Do you realize that can happen here? And so one of the things when we talk about being intentional on on growing and being disciples of Christ is that we've got to maintain an outward focus, not always looking in, not always spending on with issues within, but seeking to make a difference in our community around us. Churches that look like this forget their mission. They forget what they were placed here for, and they, they lose that calling. Sometimes they idolize another era. And they miss, they miss where God has placed them in the here and now. When we talk about what it looks like to be in a healthy church and a healthy growing relationship and, and being a disciple of Christ, I, I've shared with you in the recent days that there are five purposes of the church. And we've looked at the first two. We've talked about worship. We've talked about mission. Now we're ministry. And today we're talking about discipleship. Next week we're talking about fellowship. We're going to close with evangelism. When we talk about what discipleship looks like for many of us, Our discipleship was greatly affected by some significant people in our journey. For whatever reason, in the past week or so, I've heard many stories about this fellow on my left, Bill Higgins. I've had an opportunity to talk with some people in their homes, and and it's been interesting to hear some of the things that he's been a part of in their journey. In walking with, with, with them through some very difficult days, sharing some discipleship moments with them, helping them become better followers of Christ, or whatever it might have been. For the past several days, I've met some interesting people sharing those stories. But in recent days, I've also talked with some folks who've addressed some Sunday school teachers who've made a tremendous impact in their lives. Tom and Linda have been very significant in the lives of some young adults who are are beginning their journey and their marriage journey. Judge Potter has invested years in teaching in this congregation. Nancy Slusher. 
I, I, I can't even tell you all the other teachers because I haven't met you all. But of those I've met, I've heard those names over and again in ways in which teachers have helped shape them. I grew up in southern Illinois, and some of you might recognize this guy. His name's Doug Collins. If you don't recognize him, I put his name there for you. Doug Collins grew up about six miles north of me in a little town called Benton, Illinois. Doug Collins, if you're not a sports fan, he's an announcer for the NBA now. He coached the, the Bullets here in Washington for a couple of years, coached a team out of Chicago with a fellow by the name of uh, number 23, Michael Jordan, for a few years. Before that, he played for the Philadelphia 76ers and was on the U.S. national team, Olympic team, in 1972 when the Soviet Union stole the gold. He grew up in southern Illinois, and he wasn't that good of a, soccer, a basketball player when he, was a, when he was a kid. His coach was Rich Heron, and, and all little boys growing up in southern Illinois heard the story of Doug Collins, how he worked in the morning, how he practiced after school, how he went to practice and practiced longer than anyone else, and just by sheer determination, sheer desire, he made a pretty significant impact in the world of basketball. He had a coach named Rich Heron who invested in this guy and saw something significant in him. When we talk about growing as disciples, one of the things that's significant for us is that God uses leaders to help shape us. God uses leaders to help shape us. The Bible says it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to evangelists, some to be pastors, and some to be teachers. And their job was to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. We sometimes think, what does an apostle look like? How do we identify an apostle? And basically an apostle is one who was sent, one who has authority, one who has significant responsibility. We think oftentimes about the 12 apostles who walked with Jesus. In Romans chapter 16, there's a whole other list of guys and ladies that we don't even recognize, but they were significant leaders. A couple of weeks ago, you had a fellow stand in this place who I would consider was an apostle. His name is John Upton. John Upton works with 1,400 Virginia Baptist churches, providing leadership and insight and hope and inspiration. The other fellow there you haven't met, and I hope you will meet. He's a very dear friend of mine. His name is Emmanuel Mustafa. He's from Ghana. He has helped start 1,000 churches in Ghana. He has helped start 1,000 churches. An apostle is one who is sinning and serving and making a significant impact. Some of you also recognize these two individuals, Rick Warren and Chuck Colson, fellows who I would, oops, I back skipped those, sorry about that. I'm skipping all of them now, there we go. When I think of Rick Warren as a, as a prophet, what he has done for the church in teaching the, the, the purpose-driven model for the church, for the individuals and purpose-driven life, and talking about the peace plan, if you're not familiar with that, Google that sometime. Chuck Colson, who's addressed prison reform, prisoner rehabilitation, speaking to the hearts of government to make changes for inmates. What these guys have done in a prophetic nature is huge. You've also heard about Billy Graham and maybe Louis Palau who have spoken to millions. These folks are leaders who have influenced and had an impact. We could talk about Bill Hybels. We could talk about Andy Stanley. We could talk about any number of others. But for most of us, the leaders who have a lot of influence and impact on our lives are people that teach our Sunday school classes, that go see us when we're in the hospital, that walk with us when we're in a crisis. These other individuals do some significant things, but the calling that we have, how God uses leaders to shape us, is huge. Look at verse 12 and 13. The calling is to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming Mature, sharing, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what leaders do. Now this past week we had an opportunity to go down to Catalyst. And I'm going to ask two people to come up. James, would you make your way? And Charity, would you make your way up for just a second, please? I've asked them to, to join me for just a few moments and talk with us a little bit about, about what leadership looks like for them and how leadership was influential in their, in their journey. Can you get this? James, I'm going to start with you. Would you, uh, this is James Harris and Charity beside us here. James, I'm going to ask you a quick question. How long have you been a follower of Christ? Um, well, I was raised in the church community, so um, 
I've been in the environment for pretty much all my life, but as far as intentionally um, like following Christ, I would say probably uh, middle school, about like four middle years. School. All right, mm-hmm. James. Who was who was would you consider? most significant in your decision to get serious as a middle schooler and serious in following Christ? Um, Well, the most significant impact I can think of has probably um, been my parents and kind of the home environment and being raised with the moral values of that to keep me, you know, um, out of danger in that sense. But also um, the youth group leaders that I've had um, plant a lot of seeds and a lot of questions that are are really helpful in the development of my faith. Very so. good. James, for the record, what, what grade are you in and uh, how old are you? Um, I'm in 11th grade and I'm 16 years old. All right. It is, it, I want to tell you, one of the exciting things for me as a pastor, when I see this kid up here leading in worship, that is just awesome. I, and, I, and I hope you recognize how cool that is. Now, yes, that's fine. Charity, yes. Charity, how long have you been a follower of Christ? Um, I was also born into a Christian family, so for the most part, I was part of the church. But like knowingly, the, having the knowledge about Christ was probably when I was ten. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to that decision to follow Jesus? Well, I was in a boarding school, like. Life in Kenya is different because in boarding you don't have phones and you don't watch TV, so there's no distractions at all. So probably the um, religious leaders and the uh, teachers who taught um, Christian studies had a lot of impact because they taught me a lot of values and the kind of person I am now. All right. Well, tell us this. How long have you been plugged in here at Manassas? Probably one year and a couple months. One year and a couple months. And you're doing some different things in the church. What are some of the things that you're, you're engaged with? I help with a young adults group. I'm helping Rachel for now, and I also help with ESOL and Wired group. All right, very yeah. good. Now, a couple of weeks ago, now, we uh, made our way down to Atlanta, and we heard some awesome speakers. And James, I'm going to ask you first, which speaker was most impressive to you, and what was it about them that was most significant? The speaker that stands out the most to me um, is a guy named Louis Giglio. And just all the points he made, just really just, I don't know, it, it, they were so simple and that they were just truths I'd heard before, but they were just spoken in a way that, um, I don't know, they were just made really plain and, and applicable and they stood out to me. Okay, yeah. very good. Charity, who was it for you? What leader most stood out to you and they were significant in their presentation? Um, probably Andy Stanley because I've been watch. We had a series we were doing in my college group and just watching him speak and his words of encouragement to our, um, had a lot of impact in like because our goal for this year for the young adults group is to um, bring more people to Christ. So it is just more like an encouragement to keep doing what you're doing and that God is always going to be with us even though we feel like sometimes we lose hope and you know stuff like that. So. Oh. Mm-hmm. Now, last thing, then I'm going to be finished. James, you, you talked about Louis Giglio, and there were some other phenomenal speakers there. Was there one thing that anybody said that you want to apply, that you want to take away and, and make happen in, in your journey or make an impact in other people? Yeah, there was one thing that Louis Giglio said that just um, really has stuck with me, and it's, you know, I've been able to um, apply it already. It's basically to stop coming to God with your head hung in in shame because there's that wall of like forgiveness for yourself. Um, It pretty much said, yes, um, we're all sinners, but we're saved by grace. And let's let's focus on the saved by grace part more than the we're sinners part. Um, So that's just really stuck with me because I tend to um, have that attitude and there's just this blockage there. Um, And so that um, has helped me kind of live a more in a more more joyful manner and I think it um also when you're in the leadership lens it kind of um is contagious to other people good word that's a 16 year old boy people all right charity <laughs> what what about you what was significant for you um when Andy was saying that we should we are the generation to keep uh, our wonder awake 
because our mission as the young adults group and you know the people who help us serve with the young adults is to keep the future of this church you know where there are people to build the foundation and establish it so if we have a good foundation then the people who will follow us will follow the path you've followed so for example for gyms when they start moving so our mission is to make sure we build a strong foundation for the future of this church. I am so thankful that yeah. you are doing that in this church, Charity. That yeah. is awesome. Thank you for being in, investing in, in our young adults and our, and our students on Wednesday nights. Yeah. I'm going to pray for these two, and I'm going to pray for all these guys sitting over here on my right and the other students here that, uh, that we might have the opportunity in our Sunday school and our youth group and our whatever it is that we have to, to impact them that we can be the leaders to build them up so that 20 years from now in this place, we don't look like that church in Philadelphia. Would you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for James and Charity for the opportunity to get to know them and going with them to, to Catalyst. But God, there's a, there's a bunch of young adults in this room that I, I don't know. I don't know their names. I don't know what school they go. I don't know their hearts. But Lord, you do. So I want to pray, Father God, that, that you would use this congregation to bless our students that you would use the Sunday school teachers and the youth leaders and the, the Wired team and our, the, the D6 group to pour the heart of Jesus into them. Father, that they might, that they might share this not just in, in school next week and next month, but 10 years, 20 years from now. The fruit of their labor will be borne out in this congregation as it remains a viable, a viable part of the kingdom of, he of heaven, seeking to advance the Redeemer's kingdom from this location. Father, speak to our students, our children, and send them leaders. Help us to be the leaders that you would ask, them, ask us to be to make a difference in their lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks, James. Leaders make a difference. Leaders make a difference. You just cannot get away from that. The second thing we learn about in discipleship beyond the leadership piece is that sometimes God uses trials, sometimes God uses trials to teach us to trust Him. Guys, there's not a person in this room that enjoys a trial. There's not a person in this room that enjoys bad news. But the reality is, where we are is not heaven. We are going to face struggles, we're going to face hurt, we're going to face heartache. We are going to go through life and we're going to face some things that are not easy, that are not fun, and there are painful, hard lessons to learn. That is a given. That's going to happen. And sometimes God uses trials to teach us to trust Him. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. There's a time when we face disappointments and when we face heartache, when people let us down, when work is not a pleasant place to be, when we're dealing with fear, when we're walking with a friend through the valley of the shadow of death, that God teaches us to trust Him through those dark, hard days. That is the reality that we find. There are times when we get hit by the mess of life that we land in Romans chapter 8 and we, we think about Romans, 20, Romans 8, 28 and we, we resonate with this verse and we think about this verse and we say, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. We know that in all things God works works for the good of those who love Him. Please hear me clearly. This does not say all things are good. Cancer is never good. A car accident is never good. A divorce is not good. A diagnosis that is painful and life-changing, it is not good. But God can work through that mess to teach us all kinds of things. God can work through that hurtache. God can work through that heartache. God can work through the pain that we're experiencing and teach us how to follow Him and trust Him and know a little bit more about Him. Number, I have sat in, I can't tell you how many hospitals and emergency rooms I've been in with families and friends who've gone through some critical times. I will never forget about 18 years ago I was called to a hospital. An 18-year-old boy was driving home from seeing his girlfriend in college and he fell asleep driving down an interstate and he drifted across the median of the highway and hit a semi head on. He was driving an older model Chevy S10 and when he hit that, Chevy, when he hit that semi, 
He was thrown through that small back window. If you remember those Chevy S10s that had those small little windows, he was thrown back through that window. All of his clothes were ripped off on impact, and he was naked on the highway. They found him, and they didn't know who he was, didn't know, couldn't find his wallet. His car was so mangled, they couldn't find the VIN number to, to contact who owned the vehicle. It was eight o'clock, excuse me, it was eight hours later, 10 o'clock at night, when his family got the phone call to get to St. Louis to be at the hospital because their son was not going to make it. They made a mad dash to St. Louis, two hours trying to get there. The family said they cried and screamed and prayed in a way that they'd never cried or screamed or prayed before. This was a family that was not involved in church, was not engaged in church. In fact, they were well known in the community, but they were also well known for being pretty much against the church. I arrived on Monday after that event, and when I got there, I found out that this family was absolutely not alone. That waiting room was a large waiting room, had about 30 to 40 people that had arrived there Sunday night after 1 o'clock. And they didn't leave Monday, they didn't leave Tuesday, they didn't leave Wednesday, they didn't leave Thursday. There were people with that family for a solid week. Churches came and brought food. Churches came and brought money. Churches responded in ways that you just cannot explain. This family that had not darkened the doors of a church since their wedding were overwhelmed by the grace and the mercy and the tenderness of God by His people. Their son, their son was dramatically saved and healed and he got out of that place after a lengthy stay. And I promise you this morning that that husband and wife are in a place of worship where they are worshiping and experiencing the grace and the mercy and the tenderness of God. Sometimes God uses hard, horrible places to teach us some amazing things. And they are not pleasant. They are not fun. They are not easy. But just as God uses leaders to teach us and shape us and God uses trials to teach us to trust, sometimes God uses temptation, temptation to teach us obedience. Sometimes God uses temptation. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, it says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires, to be made new in your attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Our journey as followers of Christ, it means that there are some things in our life we need to change. There are some things in our journey that need to be done away with. There are some things that we need, to, we need to lose connection with. In fact, the Scripture says, put off the old self. And then it says very clearly to be made new in our attitudes and to, be, to put on the new self. I don't know what your, what your issue is. I don't know what your thing is. I don't know what might be tripping you up. I don't know if it's materialism, if it's anger, if it's racism, if it's prejudice, if it's lust, if it's whatever it is. There are areas in all of our lives we need to deal with biblically in a manner in which God is honored and our lives are changed. How do we, how do we deal with some of these temptations? I think we deal with some of these temptations in this manner. One of the ways we address it is by keeping our thoughts focused. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think about such things. Things. In Ecclesiastes, it tells us and teaches very clearly that we need accountability partners. We need somebody to walk through life with us because there are going to be times when we fall flat on our face and we need somebody to help lift us up and we need somebody that we can pour our deep, dark secrets that we can talk and we can trust and we can find some places of redemption. We need to look at the idea of James chapter 4 of submitting ourselves to God and resisting the devil. Friends, that's one of the ways we deal with this idea of temptation. A number of years ago, I was heavily involved in a jail ministry, and I became really good friends with the, with the sheriff who managed that jail system. In the course of our friendship, we started talking about the people who were incarcerated there. And This jail had 150, 200 inmates at any given time. He said that 80% were addicted to meth or crack. And he told me in his experience as a jailer, as a law enforcement official, there were three ways to get somebody off meth, crack, crank, whatever you want to call it. They die. They don't make it. They remain incarcerated indefinitely. They find Jesus. I was a sheriff. A couple of years ago, I ran into a friend of mine. He attended our church for years, but he was not invested very much. I knew he had some struggles with substance abuse and things of that nature. He got 
messed up with spice. Some of you have heard of spice, the marijuana synthetic drug. He was smoking spice so often that his lungs were corrupted. He was in the hospital for the whatever time, and his father stood over his bed weeping and crying. He says, this is going to kill you and me. Please stop. He made his way to a uh, rehab facility for the first time in his journey. He turned it all over to Christ, and he came out of that place, and he is one of the most significant evangelists for Jesus I've ever met because he found freedom from the chains that held him down in drug addiction. God sometimes uses temptation to teach us obedience. And I believe this, God ultimately uses our actions to reflect Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I talked about uh, Claudia Waldrop and the good words that she has shared. If Claudia Waldrop has ever written you a letter, if Claudia Waldrop has ever given you a hug of affirmation or love, if Claudia Waldrop ever greeted you at church with an embrace, would you raise your hand for me, please? Now, would you look around just a little bit and see those hands that are raised up? Friends, we can go to church and we can find people who are negative and bitter and angry and we can find that. Or we can find a lady like Claudia Waldrop, or we could be that person who is gracious and merciful and tender and welcoming and affirming. Our actions, our words, building others up, our encouragement, they are significant. I love this picture that you're about to see of Pope Francis. When Pope Francis was instituted as the Pope, one of the first things that he did was go to a prison outside of Rome and he washed the feet of 12 prisoners. That's not unusual. The popes do that. What was unusual for Pope Francis is two of the people that he washed their feet were women, and two of the people were Muslims. Now, you, you're you captivated by him kissing the feet of that prisoner. I don't want you to see the feet of the prisoner and the pope leaning down. I want you to look behind that, and I want you to look at that woman's face. Do you see the woman's face? Can you see how she's responding, seeing what the Pope is doing? Can you see her shock that a person, a religious leader, would do something of that nature? Now, I want you to hear this very clearly. It's not about the Pope washing feet. It's about you serving, loving, caring, being kind, gentle, exhibiting Jesus in the world in which you live. And you know what's going to happen? People like that woman are going to say, holy cow, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you responding? And you don't have to say a word. You can just love them and embrace them. If they ask you the question, you can tell them it's about Jesus. See, I think the way in which we change this world is when followers of Christ live out what it looks like to be like Jesus in this world. When we recognize why we are here and that God uses leaders to shape us and trials to teach us and temptations to show us obedience and that he uses our actions to reflect Christ. That's a big piece of why we're here. And then what happens when we've got this information? Friends, we let the light shine. We let Jesus shine in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our church, wherever it is. We let Jesus shine out from us. Why are you here? You are here to grow and become the person that Jesus would have you to be so that you can reflect the light of Christ wherever you go, wherever you go. At our staff meeting on Monday, I'm closing with this. At our staff meeting on Monday, we talked about all the stuff going on in the church and everybody talked about this, that, or the other. And, and we we're time to wrap things up. I, I asked the staff, I said, guys, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to tell me who was the person that was most significant in your spiritual journey? Tell me who that person was. And if you can, tell me what they did. We started with the person on my right, and before she even said a word, she was weeping. And she was able to finally get the words out and talk about what this person did. The next person literally couldn't speak because they were so overcome with emotion. The next person, again, tears flowing. And it was just an emo a time when our group were able to talk about people that made a difference in their lives. And you know what we found? It was no one behind the pulpit. It wasn't a preacher proclaiming. It wasn't an author who wrote a great book. It wasn't somebody on television. 
It was people like you who got out in people's lives and got in the mess and got in the muck and got in the junk and walked with them through some horrible events and it brought them to tears like that. That is our call to get into the people's lives that we love and share with them who Jesus is. This morning I'm going to close in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask that you consider how you live this out tomorrow when you go to work. Would you pray with me? Father God, the question is why we are here. And as we try to answer that in so many different ways, we look at our jobs, we look at our families, we look at our finances, we look at our hobbies, we look at our stuff. But Father, as followers of your son Jesus, we are here to worship you. We are here to serve you. We are here to grow as your followers. Father, that is our mandate. That is our call. Help us in whatever place we work tomorrow, in whatever place we serve tomorrow, in whatever place we go today. Help us to serve and honor you, reflecting your son Jesus in a way that people can't help but see the reality of you. Father, I have a prayer for this group, for all those who are gathered and those who are going to watch later on this week, that you would help us to take serious your call to follow Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.